Uh, hopefully this records okay, and I'll post the recording up on uh, Blackboard for you guys to review at your uh, convenience. Uh, so here, you know, we're going to continue on with hopefully um, what some of those things that you looked at in 231 or, you know, kind of jogged your memory about that we just did with respect to the refresher here. And so labeling structures, so be sure to take a look at this slide and be able to label these following structures on a neuron. So dendrites, right, the cell body or soma, the axon hillock area is really important, and then the axon itself, and then we have axon termini, right, so each one of these, you know, is a single terminal. Right? Which way is action potential going? Well, it's starting here and moving down the axon. Right? If we zoom in on this area over here, okay, if we zoom in on that area between the uh, neuron and its effector, okay, we have one cell that is before the synapse. We call that the presynaptic neuron. And then we have the cell that's going to respond. That's generally, if it's a neuron, called the postsynaptic neuron. In between here is the synapse. So information is coming from the presynaptic neuron, and then it's going to migrate across the synapse, and then it's going to continue on in the postsynaptic cell or neuron. Right? How does it do that? Well. Presynaptic neurons are releasing neurotransmitters that are housed in vesicles that will dock and release their neurotransmitter in order for that postsynaptic cell or neuron to respond. What does it have to have? It's got to have a receptor for it, right? So it's like trying to call somebody and they don't have their phone. Are they going to respond? Probably not, right? So that postsynaptic cell, that postsynaptic neuron, has to have the neurotransmitter receptor. So it doesn't matter what, how much neurotransmitter gets released if that cell that is supposed to respond doesn't have a functional receptor for it. Does that make sense to folks? All right. So here, how, do you, how can you tell whether you're looking at a presynaptic or a postsynaptic cell? What are some structures to look for? So vesicles that have neurotransmitter are going to be located where? Presynaptic or postsynaptic cell? Presynaptic, right? Cells that are going to respond, right? Postsynaptic cells are going to have what? Should have a receptor, right? Okay. So those are things that you can clue in on to figure out which one is which. So be sure to be able to label these, the presynaptic cell, the synaptic cleft, this space here, and then the postsynaptic cell with the corresponding functional neurotransmitter receptor, right? Okay. And so this was kind of that last question on the Bio 231 refresher, right? Does that make sense to folks? Are you comfortable with that anatomy? Because we're going to be using this terminology to talk about the synaptic transmission. Sorry, go ahead, Keenan. This, the synaptic cleft, yeah, is going to be this area in here. And generally, when we talk about a synapse, we're saying, okay, what's happening to get that information from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell? So it does include a little bit, you know, of the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell, you know. And so, you know, I think if I talk about a synapse, you know, I'm assuming that you're we're talking about where that neurotransmitter is coming from and the docking of where that neurotransmitter is, or the, where that uh, neurotransmitter is docking, you know. And so you do have to talk about some parts of the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell for that. If we're talking about the space of that synapse, generally we're talking about the synaptic cleft. Yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Because we're going to be using this terminology. And so if you're uncomfortable with anything, let me know sooner rather than later. You guys good? All right. Okay, so make sure you're able to label these guys. Now, what ends up happening, all right, at the presynaptic cell for neurotransmitter release? Remember, we have an action potential coming down the axon to the axon terminus, right? Okay. 
that terminal is getting a change in voltage across its membrane. Turns out there's specialized channels in there that are voltage sensitive. They're voltage gated, so it means they open in response to this voltage coming as an action potential down the axon. Now, these channels, when they open, they allow calcium into the axon terminus. So they're what we say voltage gated calcium channels. Okay? So here the action potential comes down the axon into the axon terminus, causes those channels to open, and allows calcium to go into the axon terminus. Why is that important? Well, it turns out calcium is critical for these vesicles that have the neurotransmitter to dock with the membrane and release the neurotransmitter. So if you block those calcium channels, you don't get neurotransmitter release. Everybody with me on that? All right? And so here, what we're talking about is, here's our synaptic vesicle, okay? In order for it to dock here with some of these proteins, and you do not have to know the names of these proteins, all right? Okay? All right? But I just want you to know that there are proteins on the uh, pointing outside of the vesicle and then proteins that are embedded in the membrane, and their docking depends upon calcium, and they're uh, somewhat ATP, uh, they need ATP for this to happen. And so these, what we call snare proteins, they pull the vesicle into the membrane. Now vesicles are made up of phospholipids, so is the cell membrane. So if you ever put oil on the top of water, if two oil droplets come in close contact with, with each other, what ends up happening? They come together, they fuse, right? So that's something that's happening here as well, because this is a lipid, mostly, and this is a lipid. So when they are pushed together, they fuse. And when they fuse, they create this little opening, right, that's pulled apart, and then the neurotransmitter gets released. So you may be wondering, why am I talking about snare proteins if, you're, if I'm not going to be asking you to memorize them? Turns out there's some really important toxins out there that target them. Okay? So keep that in mind, right? So in order for this whole thing to happen, though, we need calcium to come into this part of this neuron, right? What causes that calcium to come in? That calcium channel has to open. What causes a calcium channel to open? It's the action potential coming to the axon terminus. Everybody following me on the sequence of events here? All right, okay. So we have an action potential that goes to the axon terminus, causes those channels to open, causes calcium to come in, and then you get this series of events, right? Everybody with me? Okay. All right, so here our neurotransmitter gets released because we have calcium coming in when an action potential comes to the axon terminus, right? Okay. And that neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft. And then if there are functional neurotransmitter receptors for that particular neurotransmitter, it's going to cause, it's going to dock with that neurotransmitter receptor and cause a sequence of events in the postsynaptic cell. All right. Everybody with me on the sequence of events here? Okay. In order to get information from here to here, okay we have to have this series of events. All right? Now, in this case, hopefully you guys remember from the motor neuron to the skeletal muscle cell, what neurotransmitters used? Acetylcholine, right? Okay? So acetylcholine is used. So here, this is the skeletal muscle cell, therefore it has the acetylcholine receptor, which turns out is also a ligand-gated ion chain. All right. All right. So that's great and good. It tells us how the system got activated. But these systems can't stay activated all the time. That would be really bad. Right? So if you constantly were uh, had your motor neuron telling your skeletal muscle cells to contract, right? What would you look like? 
right? Yeah, you would constantly be having contracted skeletal muscle. Turns out the diaphragm, which is important for breathing, is a skeletal muscle. So what's going to happen to breathing? Probably going to stop. Does that mean you're going to live for very long? Probably not, right? Okay. So one of the reasons we have to talk about how to, you know, kind of reset the system, remove the neurotransmitter, right, is because we need to be able to regulate, you know, this response of the effector cells, the postsynaptic cell. And so we're going to talk about a variety of ways in which this happens. So one is by degrading that neurotransmitter. So acetylcholine gets released, it binds to the acetylcholine receptor, and we don't want to constantly cause our skeletal muscle to contract. So we need to remove that stimulus for contraction, which is going to be acetylcholine. So one of the things that, uh, one of the ways in which the acetylcholine can be removed is by chemically breaking it apart. And so there's an enzyme that can do that called acetylcholinesterase. So once it breaks it apart, it's no longer stimulating the skeletal muscle to contract, right? That's one way to remove the neurotransmitter, okay? The other one is to recycle the neurotransmitter. Is for that presynaptic cell, it has specialized transporters. So the neurotransmitter that got released in the synaptic cleft diffuses and then it's taken back up by the presynaptic cell. So if we're taking up that neurotransmitter and repackaging it into vesicles, right, then we're removing the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft, which means what are we doing with respect to the response of that effector cell? Is it going up or down? So if we're removing the neurotransmitter here by taking it back up, so this response is it should be less. It should be going down, right? Okay. So here, we're talking about breaking up the neurotransmitter or taking it back up. So it turns out acetylcholine is kind of a little bit more, I'll get to your question in just a second, is a bit, you know, uh, unusual because most neurotransmitters, a lot of them are actually removed using this mechanism, right? And so here, acetylcholine, uh, it has an enzyme in the synaptic cleft that breaks it down that acetylcholinesterase. Not all neurotransmitters are removed by that mechanism. A lot more of them are removed by this reuptake mechanism. All right, sorry, go ahead, Sam. Yes, yeah, so a lot of times they are, but it's a really great question because sometimes when they're taking back up in here, they're also broken back down. You know, so here, rather than having an enzyme in the synaptic cleft, like acetylcholinesterase, there's some enzymes in here that break down the neurotransmitter. A lot of times they're recycled by putting them back in vesicle stuff. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah. Oh, this is a transporter. So remember, these neurotransmitters are generally going to be small uh, proteins like peptides, you know, or small molecules. And so these are going to be some sort of transporter, like a, similar to like a glucose transporter in a way, you know, um, but they're transporters. So they're not like ion channels, you know, in a way, but they are transporters for specific molecules. Yeah. Or specific class of molecules, I should say. Because some of them are a little bit broader in specificity. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Does that make sense? So we talked about how things get activated. We can't have activation going on all the time, right? We have to reset that system. And so these are the two major mechanisms by which this happens. The major one, I would say here, is this reuptake mechanism. It's pumped back, right? And if we're pumping things back, we're pushing things against our concentration gradient, right? Which means that you know, in some cases, this is going to be what type of transport? Active, using ATP or some energy source, right? And so you can see, here's, I have some of the neurotransmitters that use this. Glutamate, GABA, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. 
a lot of neurotransmitters use this reuptake mechanism to kind of reset these events. All right? Okay. Okay, so I think we'll take a break. So why don't we take a five-minute break so you guys can get up, move around, uh, use the restroom there, and then be sure to be back here in about five minutes, and we'll talk about some of the neurotransmitters. All right, so let's continue our discussion here. Um, so it turns out that neurotransmitters, there's a whole bunch of them. All right, so there's a whole bunch of them. Do you need to know them all? No. Heck no. All right. So I have a list at the end of this PowerPoint of the ones you need to know, and there's also a table that I have on Blackboard for the ones you need to know. So, you know, don't stress out with saying, oh, there's so many, I have to know them all and what they do and their, you know, all, you know, their functions. No, you don't. All right? Okay, so there's dozens upon dozens and more and more are being discovered, and so, yeah, just keep that in mind. All right, we're going to talk about a few that are really important that come up that are drug targets, you know, and so we're going to do that. Uh, so, you know, basically the whole point of that, uh, you know, these neurotransmitters is that they're components of this synaptic transmission. So it turns out that neurons, even though we talked about the motor neuron releases a single type of neurotransmitter, most neurons are a little bit more uh, promiscuous with the types of neurotransmitters they release. So a lot of times they'll release more than one neurotransmitter. Additionally, these neurons are receiving information, which means that they have to have a receptor. So a lot of times they have receptors for a variety of neurotransmitters too. So it's actually a very complicated situation uh, when we talk about neurons and neurotransmission. All right, so here neurons can release a neurotransmitter or many types of neurotransmitters. Uh, they can release them all at once. They can kind of do one over the other, you know, and there's a whole bunch of regulation that goes on which is beyond the scope of this course. All right, but you should be aware that it is out there. All right, that you know, neurons through a variety of, uh, you know, through a variety of mechanisms can release, you know, a uh, single neurotransmitter, multiple neurotransmitters. All right. There's ways to classify these neurotransmitters. Uh, so if you have a strong chemistry background, biochemistry background, you'll be able to understand the chemical classification scheme where these neurotransmitters are classified by uh, chemical structure, right? So, you know, we're not going to use that classification scheme. We're going to be talking more about a functional classification. So here we can, you know, uh, chemical or uh, chemical structure or functionally. We're going to use the functional classification scheme. Realize that in the literature, if you guys are digging through, that a lot of times they use the chemical structure classification scheme. So we can broadly break these up into what we call excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So excitatory neurotransmitters means that they're more likely to cause an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Inhibitory means that they're less likely or making it more challenging to cause an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. All right. Now, in order for an action potential to start, what's that kind of magical, you know, area of the neuron, you know, that where the action potential starts in the neuron? What's that area called? Axon hillock, right? And specifically, those channels open to start an action potential at what voltage generally? So if you look back at your review, there's negative 55 millivolts, which we called what? Threshold, right? So here's our threshold, okay? If we get to that threshold, we get an action potential on that postsynaptic neuron, right? Everybody with me so far? So which is more likely to cause an action potential? If we get that membrane potential closer or further away, which one's more likely? Closer, right? 
So excitatory neurotransmitters move the ma uh, membrane potential closer to the threshold voltage in the axon hillock. Everybody with me so far on that? Which means inhibitory neurotransmitters do what? Are they moving it closer to the threshold or further away? Further away, absolutely, right? So it turns out excitatory neurotransmitters, they're causing that membrane voltage in the axon hillock to get closer and closer to the threshold. Inhibitory transmitters are taking that membrane voltage in the axon hillock and taking it further and further away. So here, with excitatory neurotransmitters, if we're making the inside of the cell less negative, we could be adding positive ions to it, right? Makes it less negative. We add positive charges, right? Where are those positive charges coming from? Well, they're coming from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. Well, what ion was most abundant outside of the cell? Sodium, positive ion, I should, say, should have asked, right? So it's causing positive ions to get in the cell, and specifically sodium ions, right? And that is going to cause depolarization closer to the threshold until you get to the threshold and you get an action potential. Now, how can we get that membrane voltage further away from the threshold? So what are some ways we could do that? Yeah, exactly. We could take positively charged ions out of the cell, right? We're removing positive charges, which means that membrane potential is getting more and more negative. So what's the most abundant positively charged ion inside the cell? Potassium ions. So if we allow potassium ions to leave, we're going to make that membrane potential more and more negative. Now let's think about negatively charged ions. What was the most abundant negatively charged ion outside of the cell? You guys remember? Chloride. So what if we allow chloride into the cell? What's that going to do to the membrane potential? Is that going to make it less negative or more negative? More negative. So guess what a lot of inhibitory neurotransmitters do? What types of channels do you think they open? Well, they could open a chloride channel, couldn't they? Turns out that's how some of the major ones work, which is why I wanted you guys to know about chloride. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. Well, so, so sodium potassium pumps, um, they're moving the sodium and potassium to generate the gradients. And here what we're talking about are the ch voltage gated channels or, uh, you know, that are going to change, um, I would say, yeah, not necessarily voltage gated, but uh, sodium and potassium channels that aren't necessarily pumps that are allowing those ions to go down their concentration gradient. Now, in order for chloride channels to be there and open, all right, they have to have the neuro inhibitory neurotransmitter, right? And so they have to have the neuro inhibitory neurotransmitter receptor on the post. Yeah. And so they are abundant, but they, uh, abundance is kind of a relative term. Yeah. Good question. You know, and we're going to revisit this a little bit. And so, you know, some neurons are going to be more susceptible to the breaking action of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Those are the ones that have that inhibitory neurotransmitter receptor. Others are going to be, if they don't have that receptor, they're not going to respond. So that's kind of the better way to think about it. So, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. All right, so here it turns out that, all right, well, here's our axon hillock, which is a trigger zone. We generate action potential here. And so here we have, this is our postsynaptic cell. These are our presynaptic cells. So in many cases, we have many presynaptic cells communicating with a single postsynaptic cell. Some of these post, uh, presynaptic neurons are causing, are releasing excitatory neurotransmitters which means what are they doing to the membrane voltage? Well, they're making it closer and closer to the threshold voltage, right? Some of these are going to be inhibitory, which means that they're taking that membrane voltage further away from the threshold, right? Okay. So what's happening in the axon hillock area, right? So as this uh, you know, graded potential is moving towards the axon hillock, it gets something we call integrated together. Right? So if all the excitatory neurotransmitters 
build up to threshold voltage, right, despite the inhibitory neurotransmitters, then you get an action potential. So basically, all this information kind of gets integrated, right? And so here, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So if we're taking a look here in the axon hillock, so we have an excited Tori, right, neurotransmitter causes depolarization. We're not at that negative 55 millivolts yet, that threshold. And then we have another, another excitatory neurotransmitter, right? And then we have an inhibitory neurotransmitter, right? And then we have a slightly inhibitory, and then we have another excitatory and then an inhibitory, and then we have a large excitatory that brings us to threshold, right? And so generally, this is all happening at once. The only reason we set it out, you know, in this series of events is said so that we can talk about it, right? So if we sum all of this together, you can see that what happened in the axon hillock is that we went from the resting membrane potential to the threshold, right? Everything got summed together. Does that make sense to folks? Right? So this is the integration that happens. Right? Yeah, go ahead, Esme. Yeah, so these, yes, exactly. Yeah, these are all graded potentials. Yes. Yeah, so these are graded potentials coming from here. And what we've done is, you know, this doesn't necessarily happen in this series of events where you get this one that comes here, and then this one comes here, and then this one. It all comes at the same time, right? And so they've just kind of expanded this out, right? So you can see the individual. They kind of itemized it. Okay, does that make sense, right? But here in the axon hillock, what it's doing is saying, all right, with all the inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters, all the graded potentials, did that threshold voltage get reached? If it got reached, then you get an action potential and neurotransmission from that postsynaptic cell. Everybody with me so far on this, right? Okay. So it turns out that some neurotransmitters can be excitatory and inhibitory. Now, the actual chemical makeup of the neurotransmitter hasn't changed. For instance, acetylcholine, it's still acetylcholine. But what could we change in order for that response to be inhibitory or excitatory? So in order for that cell to respond, what does it have to have on? A receptor, right? So what if we had two different receptors on two different cells? On one cell, you know, that receptor would bind acetylcholine and cause an excitatory graded potential. If we had another acetylcholine receptor, right, on another cell, when it bound acetylcholine, it could cause an inhibitory, right? So generally, these are going to be found in different tissues. So not necessarily on the same cell, all right? So we can change how a cell responds by changing the receptor on that cell. The neurotransmitter may be exactly the same, though. The chemical structure of that neurotransmitter is not changed. Everybody with me on that? Okay. All right, so here, you guys maybe remember, okay, with skeletal muscle contraction, right? Acetylcholine gets released from the motor neuron. It docks with the acetylcholine receptor on the skeletal muscle. And is that acetylcholine receptor on the skeletal muscle, is that going to be excitatory or inhibitory? It's excitatory, right? So it turns out it's a ligand-gated channel, right? It's an acetylcholine-gated sodium ion channel. So when acetylcholine binds, it opens up the channel, allows sodium in which causes depolarization and then the action potential and then a series of events to cause muscle contraction, right? So at the neuromuscular junction, the skeletal muscle, right, is the effector, and it's acetylcholine is excitatory here, okay? So it opens the sodium channels, and we can classify this as being direct because the actual channel opening is directly stimulated by the ligand binding, the acetylcholine binding to it. 
It's a ligand gated ion channel. The acetylcholine receptor is a ligand gated ion channel. So it's fairly direct. There's no intermediate events, events going on. Right? And so here we get local depolarization. It takes us closer to the threshold. We get an action potential, which means it's excitatory. All right? So it turns out with cardiac muscle, right? It has a different receptor for acetylcholine that opens potassium ion channels, and it does so in an indirect fashion that I'm going to show you guys in a second. And so if we open potassium ion channels, like you guys said, if we take positive charges outside of the cell, out of the cell, right? What is that doing to the membrane potential? It's taking us further away from threshold, right? Which means that it's inhibitory. And so here, we're able to have a neurotransmitter that could cause excitatory inhibitory effects on its effector depending upon the receptor type that's on the effector cell. And so here we get local, local hyperpolarization, taking us further away from threshold, right? Oops. Okay. And so here, just as a review, so here with the ligand gated, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the ligand gated ion channel, right? We get acetylcholine binding to it, right? And then this is going to cause this channel to open. And then we're going to allow uh, the uh, sodium ions to, to go down their concentration grade, right? So this is a ligand-gated ion channel. This is what's happening at the neuromuscular junction. All right, this is a direct effect of the neurotransmitter or a direct uh, you know, receptor. The other one is indirect, and it's called a G-protein-coupled receptor. And we're going to spend some time talking about what that is. All right, so G-protein-coupled receptors, OK? So the other one is the ligand-gated ion channel. That's a acetylcholine receptor. That's direct. G-protein-coupled receptors, you know, are also going to be indirect. There's a few molecules that we're going to need to be familiar with. So adenylate cyclase. So ACE is on the end. So what is it? It's an enzyme, right? It's a protein. Yeah, it's going to be involved, right? We're going to have something called second messengers that are be really important. And so here's some major second messengers. One's called cyclic AMP. So it's not called CAMP. It's cyclic AMP. The other one's calcium. We're going to talk mainly about cyclic AMP here. Now, why are GPCRs important? It turns out it's estimated about 35% of drugs, so a little over one out of three drugs, targets G-protein-coupled receptors. Right? So they're really common and they're common drug targets. Now, how do they work? Well, they start off as being inactive. So why are they called G-protein coupled receptors? Well, not surprisingly, they have something called a G-protein. What does a G and G-protein stand for? Well, it stands for GTP. Okay. So you guys have heard of ATP? This is another nucleotide. Okay. It's called GTP. All right. Now, this G-protein coupled receptor starts off as being inactive. And it is, has a, uh, this is the transmembrane portion of it. It goes across the phospholipid bilayer. It has a G-protein. So this is the G-protein coupled receptor. This is the actual G-protein down here. It has this GDP bound when it's inactive. Okay. Now, when a ligand binds to this receptor, it's going to cause this GDP to be released from this, and GTP is going to be loaded into this G protein. Okay? So it's going to do an exchange, you'll see in a second. All right? When GTP is loaded, it's active. The only way this exchange occurs is if there's a ligand bound to this actual receptor. All right, everybody with me so far on this? So if we don't have a ligand bound to this receptor, we still have an inactive form of it, which is GDP loaded. Everybody with me so far on that? Okay. So we're going to put this in motion a little bit. Okay. So GD, so the ligand binds to the receptor, right? GDP gets released, 
which makes it available for GTP to be loaded onto it, right? So GTP then migrates and gets loaded onto this G protein. Once this GTP is loaded on the G protein, it's going to separate from this actual transmembrane domain, all right? Okay. When GTP is loaded, we say that it is active. We have an active G protein. GDP, inactive. Okay, everybody with me so far on this? So a series of events so far, right? We had a ligand bind to the G protein coupled receptor, which caused GDP to be released from the G protein and GTP to be loaded onto it. And it's active now. What is it going to do? Well, it turns out this active G protein, it migrates to this enzyme to activate it. So it sends a, it's going to be like a domino effect, right? So think about our series of events that happen. We get our ligand binding, right? They cause this G protein to be active. And this active G protein is now going to activate an enzyme. Once this enzyme's activated, it's going to convert ATP into that cyclic AMP. As long as this enzyme's active, it's going to continue to do this. All right? Which means that it's going to build up a huge amount of this second messenger. So there's something called amplification that goes on with this, where we get, a, say, a single ligand bound, like acetylcholine, but the response inside of the cell is magnified because we generate a lot of cyclic AMP. So these second messengers, and I'll get to your question in just a second, Sam, they amplify the signal. Everybody with me so far on this? Okay. Now cyclic AMP does a lot of things in the cell. Turns genes on, turns genes off. It can turn proteins on, proteins off. The other thing it can do is that it can cause channels to open and close. All right, and so one of the channels that it causes to open are potassium ion channels. Okay, now in order to reset this system, right, we have to exchange that GTP for GDP again, right? So it turns out what ends up happening is that over time this protein eventually changes this GTP into GDP, and then we get the inactive state again, right? Okay. All right. Sorry, Sam. Go ahead. Oh, so um, it can get reused. It can get reformed into GTP. There's a variety of pathways that GDP goes down once it gets removed. Yeah. But this is a G protein coupled receptor. All right, the series of events that you should know. And one of the things, like I said, right, so this is a different view of it, right, where we get the ligand bound, the GDP gets released, GTP gets loaded. We have an active G protein that's going to migrate and then activate an enzyme called adenylate cyclase that makes cyclic AMP from ATP. So here we're just kind of passing the baton or like a series of dominoes, right? Okay. And then what is that cyclic AMP doing? Doing a whole host of things. But one of the things it's going to do is cause closed ion channels to open. If this is a potassium ion channel, potassium ions are going to leak out of the cell. If we have positive charges being removed from the cell, what's that doing to the potential? Is it making it, yeah, it's hyperpolarizing it, right? So this is how acetylcholine indirectly causes a hyperpolarization or is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. It does so through this series of events. Everybody with me on this? So it may take you a, a bit of reviewing to get comfortable with the G protein coupled receptor sets. That's perfectly fine. All right. So here, acetylcholine at cardiac and SMU muscle, right, uses this indirect or G-protein coupled receptor mechanism. Norepinephrine also 
uses a similar mechanism. And like I said, a little over one out of three drugs targets G-protein coupled receptors. So this mechanism's something that you know is really important to know. All right. So a few things to kind of remember is when is a G protein activated? What does it have loaded onto it? GTP or GDP? All right. How does it get activated? All right. What are second messengers? Why are they important? They're important for signal amplification and also activating other things, including opening of ion channels. All right. So some things to think about when reviewing G protein coupled receptors. All right. Okay. I think we'll uh, leave it there, but I have this summary here for you guys to take a look at of the series of events. All right? Okay? Okay, so um, be sure to take a look at the, uh, you know, homework, which are the online uh, quiz, which should be coming available after class today. And do that before coming to class on uh, Monday. Okay? All right? Thank you guys and have a great rest of the week. And for those that kind of want a refresher or need uh, questions answered for what we talked about, feel free to stop by during office hours or my office in general if the door is open. All right?